Ma'am, just one minute. Yeah. I'm just getting up on the live streaming. Uh huh. I just opened the seminar to all the participants, but I'm still yet to live stream it. Just give me a minute. I'm just setting it up. Certainly, certainly. Here, Amar, behind the scenes, you can talk to Emma. This is. Amar, behind the scenes, you can talk to Emma. Okay. Sure, ma'am. I'm just setting it up. Yeah, yeah. We will start yes, with the second speaker. Good to go, ma'am. Good to go. Okay. Okay. You are live now. Welcome back, everyone. This is the third day of our international seminar, and I welcome you all back to Shulini University's Department of English. And the Department of English is hosting this international virtual seminar. This is the third day. We started last Friday. We had Mukesh Williams from Japan, who gave us the inaugural address. Then Monday, Tuesday, and today is Wednesday. So we have here, you can see a panel that will impress you. And as we move ahead, we will be introducing them to you. Today, chairing the session is Nasser. Nasser Dasht Pema. He is from Azad University, Tabriz, Iran. Welcome, Nasser. Thank you so much, ma'am. It is a great pleasure for me, a great honor for me. Thank you, thank you. And um, before we begin the session, I'd just like to say a few things regarding what we are going through. We have a scholar from Bangladesh out here, Ahmad, and Ahmad is waiting. He is actually apprehensive of an unwelcome guest that is threatening to visit Bangladesh. And that is Mr. Chakravarti Tufan. So if Mr. Chakravarti Tufan upsets technology, upsets connectivity, then there might be a problem. And even right now, even right now, Ahmad is groping, he's grappling with connectivity. 
So let's hope all will be well. We will start the session very soon. I'm reminded of a line by Coleridge. He says, Our Lady, we give but what we receive. Our Lady, we give but what we receive. And in our life alone does nature live. In our life alone does nature live. Ours is her wedding garment, ours her shroud. So whatever we give to nature comes back to us. And somehow, somewhere, we have upset nature. We have upset nature and probably that is why we have to face the pandemic that we are facing now. Anyway, moving on, moving on. Yesterday, when we talked, when we were in the midst of the discussion towards the end, I did mention that we could perhaps bring all our stories together, all our COVID stories, mm -hmm. stories related to COVID. And I said, why don't you collect these stories, stories which you have felt on the pulse? Maybe not personally, maybe not personally, but somehow perhaps in your neighborhood, in your, among your friends, or some story that you have read about and that has impacted you deeply. Why don't you put it down and send it across? We'll compile them all and see what we can do with them. Perhaps we'll publish them somewhere. So make it a short story, 800 words, 1,000 words. You don't have to make it very long and just send it across whenever you get around to it. Now, this seminar, this seminar is focused on the last 100 years of English literature. And as I said in the earlier sessions, we are in a way going back to the basics. Why? Because we've gone so much into detail, so much into theory, we've gone deeper and deeper into, into our respective fields that we have lost sight of the wider picture. So, which is why my effort was to go back to the basics. And I'm seriously thinking, you can give me your opinion on that, I'm seriously thinking of having a series of seminars like this, calling it the Back to the Basics series. Back to the Basics series. B-O-B, -B. not B-Y-O-B, -B. you know what B-Y-O-B -B means, but B-O-B, -B. Back to the Basics series. So let me have your opinion on it, and uh, let's see how you, uh, how you feel, whether you think the idea will hold good or not. And later on in the year, we plan to have, at least that's going on in my mind, we plan to have a mini mellow conference here. It'll go, it's going to be a virtual conference again, because I don't think matters will open up. I don't think the world will open up soon. So we'll have a mini mellow conference. And the theme that I'm playing with is popular forms of literature, popular forms of literature, in which we can actually bring in a lot of things that we like. We can bring in children's literature, we can bring in detective fiction, we can bring in uh, mythology, fairy tales, folk tales, and uh, well, perhaps uh, we can go into the graphic sphere also, but uh, we'll delineate it, we'll uh, work it out, and I'll float the idea around. Meanwhile, you can think about it and give me suggestions. This, uh, that will be a mellow or an event like this is a Shulini University event that will be a mellow event. And I hope you like the, the clips that I, that I um, played in the beginning, the video clip that I played in the beginning. Did you all manage to see it? That was, yeah, yes. that is Shulini University. Huh? That is Shulini University and that's where I work. And you can see it's a very pretty place. So if we can't have a real a, a seminar in real life out there, we'll have one in the virtual world and you'll all be invited to Shulini. Uh, you know those essays that I want you to, the stories that I want you to send me, I am thinking of a title like Ovid's Metamorphosis. You've heard of Ovid, you've heard of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Now this is going to be Covid's Metamorphosis, stories that change you completely, that metamorphose you, right? So that is the idea I'm toying with. Right. So we begin this session, and I must tell you that our previous sessions have been circulating a lot, and a lot of people have been watching them online, on Facebook. We have had 
as many as 2,500 visits for each session. And hopefully this will also be equally popular. I would like you to share this link. It, you'll find it on the Mellow Facebook page and on the Shulini Facebook page and so many others on my Facebook page also. So why don't you share the link and let it go around? You know, looking at the numbers who are watching our sessions, it makes me feel that people are looking forward to activities like this. And I go back to what I said in the first session, that sometimes people are just waiting for someone to take the first step. And when the first step is taken, then everybody, you know, jumps onto the bandwagon and starts, you know, starts cooperating with each other. And that is how a movement begins. That is how Mellow began. And BY, no, not BYOB, but BOB. BOB should begin like this too. Back to the basics. Uh, COVID has taught us a lot, uh, many lessons, many lessons. And one of them is going back to the basics. You will agree with me. Going back to innocence, going back to a minimalist lifestyle. So let's take a backward step, which does not mean that we are defeated. It just means that we are gearing up again for a better tomorrow. All right. So let me come back to the session now. Uh, we have Nasser Dasht Pema. And Nasser, yes. Nasser, should I say Salaam yes, Alaikum or should I say yes, Namaste? Please. Should I say Namaste or should I say Salaam <laughs> Alaikum? Namaste. Namaste, ma. Namaste, ma. So he is from Tabriz and uh, he yeah. was in Chandigarh some time back with his. Uh, family with his uh, with his wife and two lovely boys and uh, those boys I'm sure Thank are you. very grown up now. Uh, Nasser, yes. has, Nasser has yes, also too. been my student and he was a very good, yeah. a very hard working student and in fact he Thank just you. insisted. He just insisted. I think I was the chairperson those days and I told him, I said, I don't have time. I cannot take you on. And he says, no, <laughs> madam, no, madam. If I want to do PhD, I will do it only with you and nobody else. Just so, with you. <laughs> so I had to give in. I had to give in before him and no regrets. And uh, I think five years ago, five years ago in Tabriz, they organized a seminar that was on uh, literature and English, uh, English language and literature. And uh, Nasser was a chief guest there. And then I saw, hey, this is my this is my student who's being treated like a VIP, a senior professor, and everybody was, you know, bowing in front of him respectfully. And I realized that this boy, is who yeah, who was my student, is actually a big man in Tabriz. And uh, Nasser worked on postcolonial drama. And just today, I was thinking of him, and I took out his book. Nasser, here's your book. He has your book, Post-Colonial Drama. <laughs> and and uh, I saw that you had not inscribed it. So you will have to come back to India to inscribe the book. OK? <laughs> and your book, I'm Definitely. sure will be. Yes. It will be an honor. So you will come back. And whenever the world opens up, you will come to Shulani. Like the other panelists, you will God all come me. to Shulani someday. And that will be really nice. Huh? Meanwhile, virtually right. and in spirit, we'll be with each other. All right? So now I'm going to Thank hand you. over the proceedings to Nasser. Nasser, can will you introduce the yes. speakers, Nasser? Yeah. You uh, to, yeah, uh, you actually, have to listen for you. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, before uh, just one yes, minute, please. just one minute. Ahmed, can you hear us? Yes. Let's see if we can hear you now. Ahmed. You are muted. I'm trying to unmute you, but I can't. All right, uh, Nasser, coming back to Nasser. Nasser, yes. over to you. Please introduce yes. the panelists and begin with Mahin, right? Thank okay. you. Okay, yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, before just introducing uh, just my colleagues now in this uh, amazing seminar uh, being actually organized by uh, Ma'am Jetka. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Jetka, for uh, initiating this kind of, you know, just online seminars. Uh, it, would, uh, it was my uh, great pleasure in the past to be your student. Uh, and now 
uh, you know, just I'm learning again from you. I'm, uh, you know, just a student again for you, okay, till the end of my life. Thank you. Thanks a lot for whatever uh, actually just you have done for all of your students, especially for me. Okay, uh, here today, uh, actually just we have uh, Ahmad uh, Ahmad from Bangladesh. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have uh, his voice. Uh, I think uh, we should start with uh, Mahim Sharma. Uh, should uh, he start or just I uh, should uh, introduce the others too. Mahim Sharma is from Department of Humanities. Uh, Maharajara uh, Agrarian Institute of Technology, uh, DGS, uh, New Delhi. Uh, should uh, he uh, actually just start or uh, the other one? Uh, actually, introduce the other panelists. Uh, introduce the other okay. panelists. Definitely, definitely. Okay, just uh, uh, first, uh, I should say just uh, uh, Mahim, uh, uh, the, uh, the first one, uh, from, uh, uh, as I told you, Ahmed from uh, Bangladesh is a professor uh, from Department of English and Modern Languages, uh, Independent University, Bangladesh, IUB. Uh, and as I told about uh, Mahim Sharma, Department of uh, Humanities, okay, in, uh, from New Delhi. And the other one, uh, Dom, uh, actually just, uh, 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 Kumadron uh, Singh, if I'm not uh, wrong about uh, his yes, uh, Kondram. Uh, Kondram Guneshwar. Kondram yes, Guneshwar. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, great. Uh, from, uh, <laughs> thank you, sorry, okay. So he's a research scholar from Department of English and Cultural Studies, uh, uh, Manipur University. Uh, in, uh, so the other one, uh, the other, this is uh, actually a uh, professor uh, is uh, Ila Rachu, Rachare, if I'm yeah. not wrong. Uh, yes, uh, he's uh, just, she's uh, assistant professor from uh, actually Dev uh, Samaj College for Women, uh, Punjab University, Chandigarh. And uh, I'm so happy to hear the, that word again. I'm in Chandigarh, I do love Chandigarh. Uh, so uh, the other one, uh, Vivek, uh, professor of English, IPU Delhi. Uh, so uh, it is uh, actually, they are our uh, uh, panelists. If I uh, forgot uh, somebody, okay, uh, please tell me. Okay. Uh, I'm from UIPS, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Punjab. Yeah, UIPS. Yes. I'm Dr. Manchinda Varaj, Manchinda, from UIPS, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Hello, nice Great. to have you. And uh, uh, it, yes, it is. yes, so it's have, a pleasure to have everybody here. Yes, Professor Jessica, please. So all the speakers have all the speakers been introduced. Kondram, Ila, Vivek, Mahim, Ahmed. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I then think. now I must. Yes, Nasser. I must also tell you that we have two faculty members from Shulini University also here on the panel, apart from me. Great. There is Purnima Bali. Hi, Purnima. Purnima. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. And a warm welcome all the presenters and participants to this third day of international seminar. So today we are going to dig quite deeply into the dramatic ocean of the literature. So let's dive and assemble the pearls. Welcome. Wow. Wow. And we have Lata Negi. Lata Negi. Hello, Hi. everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today is the third day of international seminar, and I'm very sure today is also going to be an you know, intellectual stimulating seminar for all of us. Welcome you all. Very good. So Nasir, these are my colleagues, and the third one is having yes. connectivity issues. He is running around looking for, you know, some, uh, well, something to connect, us, connect him to all of us. So Nasir, please go ahead. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so... Uh, should we start with uh, actually just uh, Ahmed or just unfortunately we do not have, uh, he's uh, actually muted. 
I think again we should just start with uh, Mahim, Mahim Sharma. Am I right? I think yeah. Start with Mahim, and next after yeah. Mahim you can go back to Emma. Okay, okay. So uh, now uh, everybody, uh, Mahim Sharma from Department of Humanity, New Delhi. I want to talk uh, about uh, uh, his uh, actually lecture, the dry tree uh, silhouettes that weighted uh, Godel, a chaotic study of Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godel. Yes, Mahim, uh, you can start talking about the, uh, you can deliver uh, your uh, paper, Mahim. Okay. So Mahim is going to talk about I, the theater of the answer. Yes. Yes, you are, gentlemen. Yeah. So, um, so I'll be talking. I'll be talking about uh, waiting for Godot. But before that, uh, yesterday's discussion was very interesting about you know how the panelists were discussing what kind of authors they need in this in these contemporary times, and uh, the the uh, the issue was boiled down to either they can bring comfort to you or they can you know bring discomfort to your personality and make you make you seek certain things out of your complacency so this is this is where this is where i'll start my uh, uh, this is where i'll start my presentation and i'll eventually go uh, go down to the uh, play so it is very important uh, i did my i did my research in uh, in uh, in science and literature so the aspect of science that i picked was chaos theory and it is a it is a relatively new theory and it, it came it surfaced itself in 1960s and that was somewhere around the time which i feel was very turbulent in case in the in the scenario of debating and in the scenario of negotiating what actually is the great divide or the great uh, gap between something that brings comfort to certain citizens of the world or something that brings a crisis so the nuances of crisis and comfort you know it can be called as stability instability it can be called as order disorder there are various words to describe these two diverging stances of existence so even 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 gramsci used to ponder upon these two uh, these two strands of intellectuals so he 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 um, he professed two categories he professed about traditional intellect intellectuals and organic intellectuals so uh, i i'll try to summarize it uh, by traditional intellectuals he meant those intellectuals who ensure that the stability of a system any social system cultural system race system any system the stability in that system is ensured by traditional intellectuals and the emergence of a new class is executed by organic intellectuals these intellectuals are the intellectuals who who are willing to compromise the notions of morality in that system they are willing to go against the grain of acceptance in that system and they bring forth ideas that are not comfortable per se they bring new ideas that bring a lot of discomfort they are good for the growth of the system but they are very discomfortable for uncomfortable for a system so the the debate of determinism and dissipation in science was very similar uh dissipation dissipation is like a noise in a system which which is associated with the breakage of a system some some physicist emphasize that if a dissip, uh, if dissipation is there existent in a system the system will break down now many scientists of chaos theory in 1960s argued that entropy that dissipation is essential for the system to evolve now that is the argument with which i'll continue this presentation now how uh, how how people how people pondered upon it even t s eliot in his poem proof rock uh, the love song of j alfred proof rock you know he said that should i after tea and cakes and ices have the strength to force the moment to its crisis now this crisis is very essential this crisis is something that i believe is necessary for the cognitive growth of human beings that is that is where even even the aesthetic beauty comes in 
so so in the 20th century there was a huge emphasis on this crisis even even wallace stevens in his poem sunday morning said that organic uh, i i i implicate that he said he was talking about organic minds when he says they will <clears throat> they will to mingle to dissipate the holy hush of ancient sacrifice now this is something this is something that was at that particular period in time and as as ma'am said that we need to broaden our perspective it is not just literature that was going through this evolving stage of cognition it was also science because science on the large on the whole is something that also deals with a lot of imagination new new discoveries are 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 certain <clears throat> breakages of old systems whenever a new discovery is done it somehow breaks in the previous system some law something something that einstein said break broke newton's notions and and what greek uh, what uh, james gleek and other scientists in the 1960s said broke the notions of the euclidean uh, eulidian geometry of this world so this was very common in science and literature now uh, now coming back to uh, how how science defined non linearity non linearity is something that causes a dissipation in a system non linearity somehow lacks explicit solutions now this is a very important line for me whenever i approach a text whenever i approach any literary text if they provide a clear cut solution to me now that is they are comforting me they are trying to tell me things are nice things will get better but i will not be inspired i will not be uh, transformed within myself to force my cognition to grow now this is very important they these equations never provided explicit solutions this is very close to how even in mrs uh, dalloway smith used the term that dr holmes was human nature now he called him human nature and he was scared of it why because human nature as mrs dalloway as virginia wool said in in and around 1910 human nature changed now this is where the emphasis was hitting if if the definitiveness dr holmes was a very was a character driven by precision he if he felt that he was overweight or underweight he used to adjust his meal accordingly the right the, the next day itself so this was this was a hint this was a hit on precision and and organic intellectuals in the 20th century started to move towards instability towards randomness towards the lack of precision that is where the theater of the absurd that is where even even text like andhayug now if you tackle a myth with the perspective that it is immoral now that is a very big deal you are breaking the nuances of morality and immorality and that slash that binary binary slash of existence which which people which traditional intellectuals uphold now these organic intellectuals try to you know make it permeable make it uh, transparent now that was very important now uh, why i why i use the word dry tree dry tree silhouette in my in my title as well because when i was studying about it uh, there was this there was this person known as gert gert allenberger he was a german scientist and he wrote a very a very beautiful thing he said why is that that the silhouette of a storm bent leafless tree against an evening sky is perceived as beautiful but the corresponding silhouette of any multi purpose university building building is not in spite of all the efforts of the architect now this is very important this is the, this is the aesthetic conjecture of literature now there is a blend and even even uh, james leek he was a very renowned physicist but he used to quote a lot of literature in his work and he said beauty is inspired by the harmonious arrangement of order and disorder now it is very clear it is very important to understand that he does not ever no organic mind says that disorder is beautiful no and if somebody if traditional intellectuals are claiming that order is beautiful exclusively now that is also wrong this zone of occult instability this middle path is the zone which 20th century i think carved very very deep in the cognition of their readers of their audience they tried to bring that discomfort of coming at the boundary of systems so <clears throat> now 
for this for this in, even in his play even in his play the uh, what where samuel beckett uh, wrote the last line was make sense who may now this was the last line of the play make sense who may this is where even even if we call if we talk about roland barthes if we talk about derrida this is where they break the authority of the author the the ownership of the author upon the word now this is very important this is very important to understand for the morality with which a word is conceptualized you know how a word has denotations and connotations now connotations have a have a moral supremacy and they say and and if a word is expressed in a manner which is you know unorthodox this is where the immoral immorality comes in so he said make sense whoever may in the play in the play waiting for godot itself they the word nothing the word nothing is repeated 22 times now this if if approached through a scientific parameter of judgment this is entropic crisis this is a halt this is a halt you know what makes a tree beautiful is its is its branching that branching is because of turbulence of random bifurcation at those entrop you know the imagine a stem and you you imagine the first step of branching you know this when the when the flow bifurcates into two that is called entropic entropic crisis now this continuously happens in a tree the branching happens constantly now this random entropic crisis causes aesthetic appeal it is not a straight line it is not a circle it is something that is beyond the predictable control of human beings that was that was the sole reason for the two world wars that we had you know the world wars were because we were driven to control we were driven to control the other system the other now that drive after that after that whole episode of existence was over after that the compassion the passion for humanity came back which we call the existential crisis and uh, which he even beckett uh, negotiates so it is very important to understand that uh, even the stage directions of the play you know there are many instances in the play and we have all read it he uh, there uh, for example vladimir says okay i'll go and the stage direction says he does not move now this is very hitting this is very evident you know the the expectational the anticipatory you know urges of cognition are like okay now he'll move but there's a discomfort he does not move the stage direction is clear he will not move even even there's an instance where he says where vladimir asks him where did you send, spend the night so estragon says in a ditch let vladimir ask him where so estragon says says over there without pointing in any direction so it is the you know it is the universal tendency of being confused about existence where rationality betrayed a common purpose of the system you know systems are made to protect you know even any race system any racial system any gender system they are made to enhance and protect but eventually they stumble upon themselves so <clears throat> now now when uh, when he starts when uh, beckett starts his next act his act 2 he writes next day same time same place in the first act he did not mention where this was happening he was it was no it, there was no specificity to the temporal and the spatial occurrence occurrences of the events and he in the second act he says next day same time same place now this this for me for 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 a for an unaware reader this is very uncomfortable you know you want to affiliate where this is happening the author is trying to give you those hints it's happening but you are not able to locate it now that is very crucial you are not able to locate it where this is happening because this is happening in every system that we have brought upon ourselves be it a racial system be it a gendered system be it a national system you know we are always fighting about national identities this is common even even manto wrote in a manner where you know he was he lacked the specificity of one community doing it to another he said one individual killing the other and it's up to you so <clears throat> this was very important now now after 
telling uh, even in science after the organic intellectuals in science told physicists that you are doing this wrong you are you are eradicating noise while noise is very useful so a dialogue in poso reminded me of those traditional intellectuals in science who denied accepting their mistake so the dialogue of poso is but now but how am i to sit down now without affectation now that i have risen without appearing to how shall i say without appearing to falter now this to accept that you were at a fault this play of ego that you need to accept that certain notions of parameters were wrong were incomplete even though they were professed as complete you know the universe there has been all these laws of everything principles of everything they want to define everything through physics but somebody came and said you know this chaos is eradicating everything so <clears throat> even uh, for example the speech the speech that lucky gives for reasons unknown in his speech the 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 statement for reasons unknown is repeated 11 times is repeated 11 times and each time for reasons unknown is repeated there occurs a branching he jumps from one state for one flow to another it completely changes the flow now that is very important to understand how a speech how we all know that it was a gibberish articulation articulation that lacks the precision articulation that lacks you know for for a, for an audience to make sense that is that is how beckett introduced discomfort to his audience now even even the realization the realization is important it is very crucial to understand that for all these intellectuals realization was important they did not want to they did not intend to invent new things they did not say now we need to bring new things they just wanted a revisit you should revisit the origins with which you assert your supremacy that is very important even andha yoga even dharmveer bharti saying even even mahashweta devi saying that true drop uh, true dropadi you know you need to trace back the origins with which you have flourished this morality into the system that is very important so <clears throat> he says the realization is there when estragon says that's the idea let's contradict each other that's the idea let's let's ask each other questions that is very important and <clears throat> and i I'll, i'll just conclude my presentation the play concludes the play concludes when uh, vladimir and estragon stand at, at the stage on the stage and vladimir says well shall we go and estragon says yes let's go and the stage direction is they do not move constantly throughout the narrative stretch in uh, waiting for godo samuel beckett has played a random stance of articulation he has constantly diverted the attention to what is not happening on the stage what is not happening what we as a reader as an audience expect each statement for me for me waiting for godo is very important a play to understand what happened in the 20th century because there has to be a realization in the elements of the system in the people of the system why because you cannot strive to attain a completely rational a completely precise system that will be the end of you know of human growth if you say now my house now my system is completely rational now that is not a proud moment beckett says that is the decadent moment that is where the problem is fine so um, so i i believe crisis and comfort i will always always choose crisis so that was my presentation any questions now or later <laughs> Thank, thank you. you uh thank you so much uh thank you so much mahim uh so informative uh, i i did enjoy your uh lecture here uh, but uh if you uh 
try to summarize your lecture just in one sentence, how to uh, actually uh, waiting for Godot el elaborates aesthetic potentiality of irregularity and disorder, okay, uh, what uh, you will say in just one sentence. Nasser, in one can, sentence? We have the, Nasser can we have the discussion after the other papers? Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. Just so that, def so that so everyone I can join in. Yes, please. Yeah. So yeah definitely. The... Great. Yeah. Uh, so can I'm... we just, uh, can Ahmed uh, start his uh, mute here? What should we do with Ahmed from Bangladesh? Ahmed, unmute yourself, please. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, ah, yeah. great. Now, he, now it is. It's on mute. So welcome, uh, Professor uh, Ahmed. Oh, again, just muted. Ahmed, yeah. Let's see um, if we yes. can hear you now. Ahmed, can we hear you? Can you hear me? Uh, it is disturbed. Start reading, start saying something, and let's see. Can you hear me? Very disturbed, very disturbed. Yes, yes sir. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I can't hear you properly, so I don't know. So let Can us hear me? go on to the. No, we cannot hear you properly, Ahmed. Let us go on to the third speaker. Let us go on to the third okay. speaker. Yes. Ahmed, am I, am I, now? Am I getting back? To you? No, no. Let, we'll try getting back to you. Our technical team will. Am I audible? Our technical team will talk to you in a little while. I'll ask a technical team to be in touch with you. Let's go on to the next speaker. Nasser, let's go on yes. to the next Kondra. Yes, definitely, Kondra. definitely. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, talking about uh, Pinter, Harold Pinter, a political implication in the place of Harold Pinter, a critic of a birthday party, and uh, the Don Raider. Okay. We are waiting for the just, uh, professor to start uh, the lecture. Can you hear me now? Hello? Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Uh, Kondra, me are audible. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this um, uh, online seminar. Uh, I'm very thankful to you, ma'am, for allowing, allowing me to participate in, the, in this kind of a seminar. And I'm also thankful to your team. Uh, uh, and very good to see you back again, uh, Professor Ahmed from Bangladesh. Uh, you were in Manipur University last time. Okay, ma'am. So uh, I'm going to speak on uh, one of the most important plays of Harold Pinter. Uh, the title is The Birthday Party. And I'm, I'm speaking on the political and metaphorical imp implications of uh, the play, the party party uh, alone. I, I will, I'll be skipping the dumb weather though. <clears throat> so to begin with, uh, my attempt is to highlight or identify the political and metaphorical implications in Harold Pinter's The Birthday Party as can be interpreted from the study of the play. Uh, well, to begin with, uh, as we all know, Harold Pinter was a prolific writer uh, he, he is one of the most original British playwright uh, of the second half of the 20th century. And uh, <clears throat> it is an interestingly, I mean, the play is an interesting, interestingly complex play. And the fact that it can uh, be subjected to various interpretations only add to its strength as a play. As Harold Hobson in his famous review of the play uh, rightly pointed out, and I quote, <clears throat> the fact, I quote, the fact that no one can say precisely what the play is about is, of course, one of its greatest merits, unquote. <clears throat> Many of Pinter's plays can be said to be about the struggle for power and domination, which has been one of the recurrent themes in his plays. The birthday party is not an exception. <clears throat> the, birthday, the birthday party is about Stanley Weber, the lone guest in, the, in a boarding house run by Mac and Patty, an old couple. 
It can be said to be a play with underlying political and metaphorical implications. The play depicts the use of authoritarian power to exercise control and overcome an individual into submission. Stanley Weber is presented as a chosen victim of a powerful organization. Though we know little about Stanley's past, he tells Mac that he was once a successful pianist and that he was betrayed by some people by sabotaging one of his concerts in which he was supposed to play. The fact that he, was, he has been staying as a recluse in the seaside boarding house run by Mac and Petty for the last one year suggests that he is under some sort of a threat from, from which he is trying to escape. But unfortunately, the threat arrives in the form of Goldberg and McCain to pursue him. In the famous interrogation scene, Goldberg and McCain accuses Stanley with various allegations. He is said to be guilty of betraying the organization and playing a dirty game, <clears throat> excuse me, and playing a dirty game, but it remains unclear what it is exactly that Stanley has done that have caused the authority to follow his trail. Stanley Weber is one of the most complex characters that we usually find in a printer play. In spite uh, of all its obscurities, Pinter's The Birthday Party can be interpreted on one level as a highly powerful play that portrays how a helpful in, help, helpless individual is forced to conform to the accepted norms of the society. Stanley is suggested to be a non-conformist and an escapist. He is a man who has turned his back to all his responsibilities as a person and has forsaken all his relations with people in his life. The political dimension in the play becomes more apparent if we consider the role of the organization that sends its agents to exercise control and authority over a helpless individual. Monty, <clears throat> one of the strangest characters in the play, uh, who sends the two agents to get Stanley, stands as a strong symbol of authoritative power whose order is to be followed at all costs. Harold Pinter is a playwright who has always refused to comment on the meaning of his plays. However, in an interview with Anna Ford, Pinter has revealed a very important aspect of some of his important plays, including the birthday party. He says, and I quote, I think the play like the birthday party, the dumber weather and the hot house are metaphors really. When you look at them, they are much closer to an extremely critical look at authoritarian postures. State power, family power, religious power, power used to undermine, if not destroy, the individual or the questioning boys, or the boys who simply went away from the mainstream and refused to become part of an easily recognizable set of standards and social values." Unquote. Well, the fact that Pinter was a Jew and he himself had experienced the hardship of growing up in a hostile environment during the, and after the Second World War in the East End part of London speak volumes of his preoccupation with the theme of power and violence in his place. As a critic suggests, Printer's imaginative imagination was haunted by crimes committed by the Nazis, but his own personal attitude as a citizen was also formed in response to the violence of British fascist gangs he personally encountered at the end of the war. The political and metaphorical aspects of the birthday party can also be understood in the light of the experiences Pinter has gone through during his childhood days. For a, for, from a very young age, Pinter has started to develop a very critical attitude towards any form of authority, authoritarian impositions. In fact, as a youth, he has had to face court trials and many and nearly escaped prosecution for being a conscientious objector by refusing registration of service for service in the British military. One of the most interesting facts to note about the play 
of Harold Pinter is that many of them almost always share a simili similar setting, a room, that is, which is usually a room. The image of two or more people in the room has always been the subject of most of Pinter's play. The birthday party is not an exception. Pinter's rooms are private worlds inhabited by people who remain constantly afraid of an intrusion from the outside world. It is the sudden and uninvited arrivals of a, peop of a person or two from the outside world which has caused misfortune to the inhabitants of the room in many of Pinter's plays. In fact, the room in Pinter's place can be regarded to serve as a metaphor in itself. It may be interpreted to represent a secure, a secure place, supposed to be another Eden, free from all worries and threats, but it unfortunately fails to prevent the intrusion that bring messages of doom for its inhabitants. For example, Goldberg and McKen can be regarded as one of the strangest peers of, peers of characters in all the literatures. The real identity of the two men is kept a mystery. They only reveal themselves as agent, agents of an unnamed organization that puts them on a mission which is to be successfully accomplished at all events. Their job in the play is to take Stanley away with them to be presented to the authority. Goldberg, the senior partner of the two, is a cunning professional. He skillfully plans the operation of the mission with great accuracy and mastery and forced their helpless victim into submission. It is believed by many critics that Pinter has invested a slight hint of symbolism in his portrayal of the two agents in the play. In his letter to Peter Wood, the director of the first production of The Birthday Party, written in 1958, Pinter has offered an important clue regarding the two characters, Goldberg and McCain, when he writes, and I quote, I think the house is in pretty good order. We have agreed. The hierarchy, the establishment, the arbiters, the socio-religious monsters arrive to effect alteration and censure upon a member of the club who has discarded responsibility towards himself and others." Unquote. A very significant statement that supports the strong presence of political and metaphorical implications in the play comes from none other than Pinter himself when he said in an interview with Mel Gouchot, uh, and I quote, between you and me, the play sought how the bastards, how relig religious forces ruin our lives. How, but who is going to say that in the play, unquote. With the power invested on them by the authority, Goldberg and McCain carries out the attacks with, which resulted in what Pinter calls the destruction of an individual, the independent voice of an individual. The struggle for domination through the exercise of powerful language Language game has become a recurrent theme in the play, plays of Harold Pinter, including the Barty Party. No wonder, as Pinter, Pinter tells Anna Ford, and I quote, I have been writing plays for 30 years, and many of them have to do with the mode of operation, of terrorizing through words of power, verbal power, verbal facility. In the, in the Barty Party, I think it is most evident. And Pinter's The Barty Party, is not simply a play about a pathetic, pathetic victim brainwashed into social conformity. It is a play about the need to resist with the utmost vigor, dead ideas, and the inherited weight of the past. There is no doubt that Stanley exhibited this spirit of resistance. However, as the play ends, with Stanley being taken away from the house, a broken patty utters one of the most forceful lines in the play, when he tells Stanley, and I quote, Stan, don't let them tell you what to do, unquote. It can be interpreted as an expression of the author's strong belief for the need for, of an attempt to put up resistance against any form of injustice. Uh, then it is therefore safe to say, without denying the possibility that the play can be subjected to various other interpretations, 
that the harut pictures the birthday party is a play that expresses strong implications of political and metaphorical significance that is what i will or what i want to say thank you all very much thank you uh thank you so much uh for your uh, informative lecture uh, gentlemen i did enjoy your lecture a lot okay uh thank you once again ahmed uh do you hear me uh, can we hear you are you ready can you can yes ahmed uh actually professor uh, uh Ahmed Ahsan Uzman, a professor from Department of English and Modern Languages. I'm trying to unmute him, but I cannot yes. unmute him. Oh, oh my God. So, uh, uh, what, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? No, it is still disturbed. It is still disturbed. Say something else. Can you hear me? No, it will not work. It will not work. Let's go on to the next speaker. Kondram, where are you from? Okay. Kondram? Hello, ma'am. Kondram, where are you from? I'm from Manipur University, ma'am. Can you hear me? Manipur. So we are getting people from the Northeast also. And uh, well, we need to move on. The next uh, speaker, Nasser, next speaker. Ila. Yes, the next speaker is Ila, uh, assistant professor, okay, from uh, Deep uh, Samaj College for Women, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. Somebody from Chandigarh. It's a great honor to see somebody from Chandigarh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, thank you, Nasser. And this is such a great honor for me to be here. Thank you, Professor Jaitka, for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible clearly? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. And when the very first instant I got your um, uh, email and uh, I saw the subject, the, my first reaction was I would speak on the second sex or uh, sexual politics because that is my area of interest and that's what I've been working on for a long time. But I thought I'll be for many years. And today's situation, it uh, made me write, it made me go back to the text. And thank you again for the team, Shulini, to make us go back to the text. Because more and more we find universities, um, uh, you know, stressing the need for theory, theory, theory. And we as students, we learned everything from these texts. So it has been a beautiful last 10, 15 days going back to Edward Albee. So I'm, uh, <laughs> let me see what I have to say and how I can put it in uh, <laughs> these minutes and speak and not read. <laughs> so uh, it is, I'm going to talk about how to comprehend the absurd. The absurd as in the absurd drama, the absurd as in the absurd times, the absurd as in the absurdity of life. So Edward Albies, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, it was first staged in 1962 and um, what a success it was. And as I was going through the through Google, Googling at this, uh, and I realized that uh, as late as 2019, there have been stage shows. It has continued to be so popular. And it was first stage where at the peak of the Cold War era, it is a, was a mirror to the world that had already witnessed uh, the inhumanness of the world wars, the unapologetic killings of the Russian royal family, the rise of communism, the Great Depression, the apparent end of colonialism, and a general acceptance of uh, Darwin and Freud. And when we find Eliot voicing his concerns in the wasteland in 1922, and Osborne expressing the angst in Look Back in Anger in 1956, Beckett jolting the audience out of their every by showing a complete disruption of all that was sacred and all that made sense in Godot in 1953, we get a taste of a world falling apart. The loss of hope and the inner conflict which had its beginnings in the 19th century was shred of any vestiges of hope as the world witnessed the horrors of the two wars. 
and as in his keynote address professor williams said that this was a world which uh, uh, had now become acquainted because with the poison gas this was a world which uh, had become acquainted with the gas chambers this was a world which knew the jewish genocide the holocaust so th this is world is absurd an american dream and the apartheid they could not coexist so the social religious political institutions they were being questioned and women's rights and call for gender equality it raised doubts of serious doubts about the relationship norms in such times i believe drama provided the much needed medium to explore the subconscious mind and to depict the hidden layers of human thought and interaction and theater of the absurd showcase this human situation and predicament so very beautifully and let me quote from martin eslin's absurd drama where he says the theater of the absurd attacks the comfortable certainties of religious or political orthodoxy it aims to shock its audience out of complacency it is a challenge to accept the human condition as it is in all its mystery and absurdity to bear it with dignity nobly and responsibly i find this very pertinent especially in the present times and precisely because there are no easy solutions to the mysteries of existence because ultimately man is alone in this uh, meaningless world and eslin he felt that the works of uh, adamov unesco and jene perandolo pinter albi they all reflected uh, camus philosophy the philosophy which uh, uh, emphasized that life is without meaning philosophy expressed in his uh, the myth of sisyphus and eslin also he traces the influence of the elizabethan tragic comedy on the absurd the tragic comedy of shakespeare and here i am reminded of uh, what nell had to say in the end game that nothing is funnier than unhappiness it is the most comical thing in the world so camo also ob observed that in the absurd drama uh, the writers they discovered a new medium an expression where they could uh, uh, render this absurd experience where they could render their experience this experience in all its acuteness and immediacy and albi i find in who's afraid of virginia woolf he lays bare the madness in method as he chooses a very very conventional structure for his play the play has three acts titled fun and games walpurgis night and exorcism it adheres to the unity of time and place and presented as a game as a ritual um, the play seems to be a very realistic portrayal of uh, psychological frustration initially it seems an innocent display of martial uh, marital disharmony between george and martha a very very american couple who are frustrated and who exhibit a deep seated anger on having missed out on the american dream and a younger couple nick and henny who act as both a foil and an extension of the older couple and much of the conflict i believe it revolves around martha's uh, failed aspirations her unproductiveness her frustrations and george's complete uh, indifference to materialism and uh, his uh, powerlessness also and nick is a product of uh, who acts as a foil also he he's a product of the american society the he is ready to again follow that very path to again uh, um, follow the path which has been set by martha's father um, who is the president of the college and for this for a status and a um, some kind of recognition he is even ready to uh, sleep with the daughter and nick his nick's wife honey she is so effeminate and most of the time when she is on the stage you find her either resting or drinking or discussing her bad health so you find that the situation the characters the setting the language uh, the interaction it is very realistic but here i feel soon the audience becomes aware of the layers of conflict that the writer mercilessly he pulls off the bandaid 
Structurally, the play is conceived as a play of games, as a series of games that George and Martha play on their unwitting guests. But elements of dark comedy, elements of absurd, they creep in and uh, like initially we have a very realistic play and that there are traits of a naturalism play there, but gradually it converges with the absurd drama as Albi reveals the pointlessness of human existence through the ritual of banal and a vacuous marriage, deprivation, degeneration, and sorry, depravity and degeneration. And there is a, a purposeless interaction which is presented through uh, cliche dialect, grunts and silences, and a whole fabric of illusions that help Albi to expose the stark human reality which the individuals have uh, to ultimately gather the courage to face the cruelty, the shamelessness, the vindictiveness with which George and Martha hit each other, and the perfectly synchronized manner in which they attack Honey and Ick. It lays bare the utter sense of loss, the depravity born out of a moral vacuum, and the insurmountable desire for revenge, and leaves the audience breathless. But Albi is not even halfway through. With the introduction of the mysterious sun, the plot becomes complex and many layered. The play pans out like a symphony gathering together all the discordant notes to create the perfectly orchestrated denouement. And in this tradition of the European uh, absurd drama, Albi presents a world alienated um, in of alienated individuals uh, completely disillusioned. And to paint this picture of incomprehensible human situation, Albi relies uh, uh, heavily on numerous illusions. George and Martha, who tear each other apart as the audience sits fascinated by this painful and sometimes uh, verbal pugilism, and which turns into a night long orgy there. It, they derive their names from the Washingtons, George Washington, who symbolizes everything uh, which is there about America of hope, of uh, freedom, and everything gone sour up almost a century later. And Martha's father represents the materialism, the hierarchical order, which needs to be sustained at all costs, at the cost of individual freedom. And the place they live in, New Carthage, is an allusion to a ruined civilization. And George, who is a professor of history, he's unable to face uh, um, the reality. And he's, he also curls up with the book. And the book is Pendler's The Decline of the West, while his wife is busy seducing the guest, Nick. And Nick, again, he is uh, um, he's credited with a chromosome alteration scheme. And uh, he again, he dreams of uh, producing a perfect future generation. So again, ready for a pitfall there. And Albi's play embraces not only history and uh, science, but even religion, because we have Nick's father-in-law, uh, who is a preacher, a traveling preacher, who has managed to reconcile, some way he's managed to reconcile God and mammon. And we, sometimes we just might to tend, uh, you know, um, just overlook these uh, small details because we the audience might miss it so uh, fascinated hypnotized by the spectacle of the couple tearing each other apart but right there right at the top he you know he is in just these three hours he's putting an entire philosophy on the stage and uh, what he uses the title where who's afraid of uh, virginia wolf and Virginia Woolf refers to a whole institution, a whole movement. One of the best uh, writers to use the stream of consciousness technique in such a beautiful way to express the hidden layers of the mind. And she is the one who favored individual freedom to institutions, to uh, authority, to conformity, and um, emotion to a system or method. And in this allusion to Virginia Woolf, I also find some hint of uh, uh, mental breakdown in the face of reality, in the face of death, which is so painful, as it is there uh, um, so much associated with Woolf's life. And the play also refers to um, Disney's, uh, the, the song in the Disney film, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? 
and there the bear who's able to face the reality is the one who is best prepared and who survives and um, in this you have the uh, the ending is so beautifully played out the play is set right in the um, uh, you know morning hours of sunday from 2 am to the dawn and uh, we realize that the night is darkest before dawn and uh, we see in these 3 hours that an old order is destroyed there is some hope for the new because they have the courage george has the courage to destroy the sun and uh, uh, and martha and she accepts that she is afraid of uh, the wolf she is the, the one who is afraid of the virgin of virginia wolf and we feel that by embracing fears by facing reality they shall experience freedom they are free from the shackles of illusion and as eslin stated the theater of the absurd does not provoke tears of despair but the thought of uh, liberation and um, uh, had i think uh, yesterday or the day before rashmi was the one who spoke about uh, how even we have uh, dropped all pretense there is no pretense to humanness also so today when we look 60 years from then we look at the situation now there are two things which come to my mind first is that uh, we in this crisis this crisis has shown us that again our parameters our benchmarks our concepts of success growth um, coherence uh, peaceful coexistence everything have uh, has been shaken because uh, we find that these benchmarks and parameters um, that uh, were given to us by the developed nations and uh, when they said that uh, the america and italy were the best nations were best prepared to face an epidemic and what the reality is it is uh, something very different and the second thing which i find especially among my students in a, a life of illusion and facing reality there is a whole new world of uh, illusions being created through social media through instagram through facebook posts everywhere and when whenever any individual wakes up to this reality of that world of illusion and the world he or she is experiencing then we find so many cases of uh, depression and uh, so i believe that uh, who's afraid of virginia wolf and this drama this albies this wonderful play it remains so relevant today also and because it is not just talking about a time it is so universal in the predicament that it presents thank you i hope i have stuck to my time because i don't find yes. nasir showing me the board yes. i think i think we all got so carried away we all got so carried away that even nasir forgot to show you the <laughs> no actually just i had it here. <laughs> <laughs> no. I Thank think you so you much. What carried away? Uh, that, uh, we are going to we are going to carry on much before for uh, much after four o'clock it seems, but never mind. Let's do the best we can. We have uh, one more speaker, Manjinder, and uh, I have also got Ahmed's PPT, which we will see after Manjinder's paper. So, Manjinder, uh, please try and make it short. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, the focus of my paper is on the thematics of Edward Elby's "Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf." Uh, Ma'am has discussed much. My paper will be some additions and a bit of revision. Uh, Edward Elby, as a playwright, penetrated beneath the exterior of modern society to unearth the fears its people harbour. For it is the prerogative of both a dramatist and a critical thinker. In Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, L.B. allows his character to confront the harsh realities of their lives by coming out of the bizarre fictions they have nursed for long. For such realities allow his characters to accept and repair the ruins of their past. George and Martha, by forgiving each other at the end of the play, create the possibility of love to reassert in their lives. Elby's play demonstrates that we need to question the traps that confine our lives by taking a leap of faith. Though shattering of these traps 
might momentarily land us in phases of madness yet this madness only offers refuge from the conventionalized lies which allure us all the play critically analyzes institutions and values that americans held dear uh, namely family marriage and success for instance it be suggested that they might have been created in part to escape from reality who's afraid explores themes such as death uh, stolidity the corruption of the american tree coming to the characters of the play i'll rush through the characters for better understanding uh, george is an associate professor of history at a college in new england town of new carthage at 46 he should probably be furthering his career but due to a lack of ambition coupled with a bad relationship with the college president who happens to be his father in law george has become bogged down professionally personally also he is married to martha who is 6 years older than him and they have been married for around 23 years their marriage has degenerated into an ongoing battle of words and psychological games to get the upper hand nothing is told of george's early life george relates a story that he claims to be autobiographical there are clues to suggest that a boy in the story whom george refers to may actually be george himself the boy has murdered his mother and caused the death of his father it's evident that george suffers from a great deal of conflict about his parents uh though most of the play martha gets the better of george beating him down psychologically in the end however george proves himself stronger than martha his decision to kill their imaginary child a fantasy he and martha have shared can be viewed as an act of heroism or as an act of revenge martha intelligent well read and perceptive hides her intellectual gifts beneath an aggressive and vulgar exterior she tries to control and dominate her husband for certain reasons she resents him initially to fulfill her father's role both professionally and psychologically and george is not able to live up to the expectations martha battles almost continuously with george as an act of attempted communication good thing that some communication takes place only when george successfully ends their fantasy of over, of having a child that martha admits being vulnerable and has a fear of what lies in future for him and george nick another character one of george and martha's guest is young in his 30s and is attractive and physically fit nick seems the ideal man but he eventually reveals himself to be hollow is amoral shallow and coldly ambitious his willingness to be seduced by martha despite the presence of his wife and george is evident of a cynicism and lack of morals nick's profession as biologist is contrasted to george as a historian biology in the play is viewed as the science whose practitioners are determined to toy with human genetics in order to create a race of perfect human beings nick suggests the results of these experiments the wave of the future attractive on the outside empty within nick's wife honey who is 26 is on the surface a sweet gentle girl eager to make a good impression she is unable to handle her liquor and her mindlessness reveal her inability to cope with the reality her use of secret birth control devices reveals a deep seated fear of having a child and a fear of growing up coming to the major themes the first truth and illusion George and Martha's marriage and possibly their lives have been held together by an illusion the imaginary child that they have created together and uh, that must now be destroyed if they are to face reality the surface truth of the character masks their real selves the brash and vulgar martha is actually vulnerable uh, george seemingly passive is the one who takes control of martha's and his own life 
neck and apparent stud turns out to be important. This is the place most important thing that people today have been forced to create uh, illusions for themselves because the reality has become too difficult and painful to face. The second thief, the inability of communication. Uh, the characters are constantly but unsuccessfully attempting to communicate on a deeper level with each other. Uh, their competitive insults and verbal cruelties until the last scene finally help them achieve some mutual understanding. Uh, George and Martha's attempts to communicate seem more genuine than those of Nick and Honey, who seem to know each other, but very superficially and deliberately they deceive each other. Their usual social communication suggests the emptiness of their language. Now, uh, the third theme, the theme of sternity and importance. Physical relationships amongst the characters of the play represent barrenness and importance. Even the name of the town, New Carthage, suggests the ancient civilization destroyed by Rome and sown with salt to prevent fertile growth. In the play, physical relationships amongst the characters are neither a source of comfort nor a source of growth. Next is the theme of marriage and relationship. The play can be read as far as George and Martha are concerned as the story of one couple's desperate attempt to salvage rather than destroy their relationship. After the evening's emotional turmoil, George and Martha try to clear up some of the matters impending their relationship and they may be able to function as a better couple in the future. LB gives us this faith. Now, coming up to the theme of religion, which is also dealt beautifully in the play, uh, references to God and Jesus are often used as swear words frequently throughout the play. Martha declares herself as an atheist. The title of the second act of the play is Well Perched Daesh. It suffers and uh, it actually uh, is a pagan ritual meaning uh, Night of the Witches. In European folklore, it is a night when witches meet to indulge in orgies. The title of the third act is the exorcism. In Christian mythology, this rite is practiced to get rid of a possessed person of the demons within him. Martha is the subject of an exorcism when George convinces her that their son, a figment of their imagination, is dead that the illusion that has sustained them must be eliminated if they are going to face reality. Coming to the title of the play, the title of the play is a parody of the song Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, a song in Walt Disney's animated cartoon version of the Three Little Pigs. Means the, uh, the symbolic meaning is who's afraid of living life without illusions. Uh, George inspires the new generation to recommit themselves to the American ideas of individualism, liberty, and self actualization, as well as values of community, communication, and shared morals and values. Coming to the theme of history versus science dealt beautifully in the play. Since LB gives the most eloquent speeches to George, who is a history professor, whose work concerns the endless variety of human motivation and endeavor, LB is using George's character as an antithesis to Nick and condemns signs uh, for many of the ills of mankind. Yeah. Quoting George, uh, I suspect Ms. we will Manju, not Man, Manjinder. Uh, Manjinder. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, thank you so much. Sorry for interruption. You have just one minute. Please. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, the thank theme you. of uh, American values has already been discussed by Ella Ma'am. Uh, I bring the conclusion by quoting Edward L.B. He said, all my plays are about people missing the boat closing down to young, coming to the end of their lives with the regret at things not done. LB believed that life must be a combination of two things, 
instructive to myself that I don't fall into a trap of wasting my life and also the fact that I think it's one of the most terrible thing that could happen to anyone to come to the end of life or close to the end and realize okay. that one hasn't participated and there is nothing to be done about it. Martha okay. and George in this sense make good the loss. LB does not spell out solutions. He leads us to fresh insights and self-awareness that one should think of the world around oneself and participate in it. Feel its anxieties and fears. The function of the art should be to bring people into greater touch with reality. It's a sorry state that people don't want art to be disturbing. They want it to be escapist. LB reiterates, I don't think art should be escapist. That's a waste of time. With this, okay. I answer yesterday's question, what kind of writers we look forward to, raised by Madhu Jadkama. Certainly, I would say LB and his kind. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, oh, and we have, gender. Yeah. We have, uh, we have Emmert's PPT out here, but let's give it one more try. Emmert, speak something. Let's see if he can hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? No, not very clear. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, share the screen and I'll show the PPT and I'll, we'll read out, right? And if there are questions, you can answer on chat. This is the best we can do. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. What about... Can you see the screen? Oh. Yes. All right. So this is the this is a PPT that uh, Ahmed has sent me, and he would have made use of it in his presentation. However, because of audio problems, we are now seeing it this way. So the first slide is yes. salutation and acknowledgement, and uh, we'll move on to the next one. I plan to talk about two plays. Sorry. I plan to talk about two plays by the bilingual Bangladeshi playwright of international fame, Saeed Ahmed, in the light of Bloom's provocative anxiety of influence to show how Ahmed misread Beckett in, in creating his plays, mm -hmm. The Thing in 1962 and The Milepost in 1965. The Thing, entitled Kalbela in Bengali, is the first Bengali play in the first absurd and the first absurd play in Bengali. However, acting upon, well, he's taken my name, Manju Jadka's thoughtful advice to the presentation, I will focus on Beckett and his waiting for Godot, leaving aside the misreading part. However, I will make some remarks about Emmert's The Thing towards the end. Setting the absurd, Chaplin-esque, the bowler-hatted tramp the kid, the gold rush, the absurd, absurdity of life. So he is drawing a connection between the work of, God, of uh, Samuel Beckett and Charlie Chaplin. Also making a connection to Kafka, Kafkaesque, the bizarre, nightmarish, often meaningless, absurd world. And he's also drawing a connection with Sartre, existentialism in his nausea. nausea. Then Ahmed's intention was also to speak of Camus, in particular Calig Caligula, started in 1938, the final four act version, which was published in 1944. The play was part of what Camus called the cycle of the absurd, along with the most known of his works, The Outsider, and the long essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. We have been talking about The Outsider and the Mist of Sisyphus in yesterday's session. There's a quotation out here. What I want is to live and to be happy. Neither to my mind is possible if one pushes the absurd to its logical conclusions. What I want is to live 
and to be happy. Neither to my mind is possible if one pushes the absurd to its logical conclusions. Caligula discovers at the end that his much sought after total freedom is empty and cannot bring him any joy or release. That's why he ignores the plot to assassinate him so that the conspirators can take his absurd logic to its logical conclusions. The argument central to the myth of Sisyphus is that life is essentially meaningless. Although humans continue to try to impose order on existence and to look for answers to unanswerable questions. So far as Camus is concerned, Sisyphus's struggles stand, struggle stands as a potent metaphor for the individual's persistent struggle against the essential absurdity of life. He does not approve of suicide. He holds that only al al the only alternative is to rebel by rejoicing in the mm -hmm. act of rolling the boulder up the hill. Camus argues that with the joyful acceptance of the struggle against defeat, the individual gains definition and identity. And there's a quotation out here. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one, one's burden again, but Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that neg negates the gods and raises rocks. He, like Oedipus too, concludes that all is well. This universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night filled mount, uh, mountain in itself forms a world. Coming to waiting for Godot, this is an experience, this is to experience the action of time which is constant change. And yet, as nothing real ever happens, that change is itself an illusion. The ceaseless activity of time is itself defeating, purposeless, and therefore null and void. The more things change, the more they are the same. That is the terrible stability of the world. This is a quotation from Martin Eslin. And a quote from Waiting for Godot, Estragon says, let's go. Vladimir, we can't. Estragon, why not? Vladimir, we are waiting for Godot. Vladimir, why are we here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this, that we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. We are not saints, but we have kept our appointment. Vladimir, he didn't say for sure he'd come. And if he doesn't come, we'll come back tomorrow. And then the day after tomorrow, possibly, and so on. The point is, until he comes, you are merciless. Now, how does it resonate with today's pandemic affected world? The questions that bother us will, are, will there be a vaccine anytime soon? Will there be an end to this social distancing ever? Will there be on-campus international academic seminars? We don't have answers to these questions. This will let us know how important Beckett's aporia mm. is. Is there a Godot? If there is, is it a human being or a cosmic force? Shall the tramps' suffering end? Emerge the thing is an absurd play with a difference. As a thing, the cyclone arrives. At this very moment here in Bangladesh, as we wait for Amphan to make its landfall, Ahmed's play becomes incredibly relevant. In fact, the play is set against the severe cyclone that hit the coastal areas in 1961, devastating the lives of the inhabitants of Char Alexander. With the wind blowing and the dry leaves floating on the stage, enters the drummer to deliver the news that the thing has really come, that the cyclone has ravaged the island and that his job is finally done. The drummer says, well, I guess my job is done and nothing more to announce. Well, it ended the way we would expect Godot to end. And I have not done full justice to it. The way Ahmed would have read it, I'm sure would have been very different, but I've done the best we could in the present circumstances. So thank you very much, Ahmed. I'm sure if you had to 
read it out to you. The impact would be really good and uh, well. But uh, let's see if you can take any questions. Uh, now, sir, you can open. You can open yes. up for questions and see if there are any questions and put them right. And if there are any yeah, questions uh, for Emma, then he can answer via chat. Okay, uh, uh, Professor Jitka, what about uh, uh, Kafka's trial in cinema? What well, that will be after that? after we have done with this, because then I want to keep thirty minutes specially for Kafka's for Kafka's trial. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, any. Uh, so, where are the other two I participants? Think... I can't see them. Manjidda, where are you? Uh, Please come back. Hila is here. Mahim, Mahim, you're here. Khondram, Khondram, please come back. Yes. Nasir, do you have the questions before yeah. you? Yeah, you know, just uh, I actually just I wanted to ask from uh, Mahim, Mahim Sharma. Is I don't know, just uh, Mahim is available or not? Yes, Mahim is here. Uh, okay, just uh, I I ask him okay, to just say in one sentence how you know just uh, Beckett's waiting for Godot. Uh, elaborate uh, the aesthetic potentiality of irregularity and disorder. Okay. Yeah. May, uh, can I speak? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yes. So, in one sentence, I'll try to. I'll try to, but I don't think I'll be successful. So, I'll try to summarize it in one sentence. So. Uh, there's this dialogue. There's this very prominent dialogue. Nothing happens. Nobody comes. Nobody goes. Now, if you take this dialogue and you affiliate its crisis, if you place its mm -hmm. crisis in the human condition of 20th century, it is very important yes. for the growth of human cognition. This is where I say the comfort is towards decadence. And this crisis is something that pushes mm -hmm. us forward to keep coming back. You know, they see those leaves again on, the, on that dry tree. And they say things have changed since yesterday. So yeah. I think it's more hopeful. Thank you. Crisis is more hopeful. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Jetka, uh, may I suggest uh, something here before going on uh, actually about uh, next seminar? Is it possible? Yes, yes. Please speak up. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Professor Jetka, uh, it, it occurred into my mind, you know, just what about uh, uh, have a seminar about, you know, just uh, nature and human being? What about, uh, what about eco -criticism? Nowadays, just in time of lockdown, no, coronavirus, what, what, Saturday, said, we have Saturday, done. Nasser, Nasser, on, yes, Saturday, on Saturday, we are going to have a meeting just to discuss that, okay? Right now, oh, great. Right now let, us see, let us see if there's any more discussion we can have on the papers that were presented. Yeah, Vivek, great. something to say. Vivek, yeah. what do you have to say, Vivek? One more question in the uh -huh. section. Please have a look at that. In the what section? Q&A? Q&A, yes. Yeah. The question is again to Mahim, but I would like the other speakers also to look at it. Uh, that was quite an interesting take on Godot with respect to chaos theory. My question is, if entropic mm. crisis or dissipation leads to aesthetic appeal, then how do you understand the age of modernism at large? Optimistic, pessimistic, or any other? If I, you could I share think, your thoughts briefly. Yeah, I, I would say it's more celebratory. You know, there, there is, there is the, the, the feeling of remorse and regret uh, in the postmodernism, in the postmodernism, after in the, uh, uh, if I say how Derrida de dealt with it, you know the, the concept of free play, it's more celebratory rather than regretful. If you say that the centrality of the system is taken away, it's not a notion of regret. You don't, we don't uh, curse ourselves or we don't condemn ourselves that we are not fallen. It is a privilege. Sometimes being immoral, even beauty can be immoral. There's a very huge take on that aesthetics can arrive
to human consciousness through immoral stances of reality now i'm going to i'm going to ask a question to emmer emmer you can type it in the chat box and then i'll read out your answer meanwhile i'll talk to the others also emmer you uh, you have been talking about the thing the thing the bangladeshi play the thing now when it is staged can you hear me can you hear me just nod and tell me can you hear me emmer yeah now when it when a play like that is staged in bangladesh are the people aware of the connection with waiting for godo how do they respond to it and how do how do uh, play goers in uh, in your country how do they react to godo this is my question and if you could type the answer in the chat box i'll read it out to you meanwhile maybe the the ones who presented on virginia wolf who's uh, who's afraid of virginia wolf i was wondering i was wondering uh, what kind of a feeling does that play leave you with what kind of a feeling does it leave you with i think ila and manjinder hmm? so maybe ila can try answering the question briefly and then manjinder because it seems to be full of a lot of negative emotion ila yes, yes it is uh, and um, as i was uh, reading it now and reading about it now i was remembering the first time i approached this text as an mphil student and uh, professor jisbir jain had taught us this play and initially we were like uh, we were just reading it and uh, as uh, normally students do you don't read the text at home first you just read it in the class so that's what we were doing and uh, at that point it was it played out like a uh, play about marital discord and there was so much negativity and we couldn't relate to what was happening on the stage the uh, Ma martha seducing uh, nick right in front of george and we were we had all our judgments and everything but when it ended at that time when i read it then when i taught it for so many years to students of kullu and i remember my principal who was from literature he told me that uh, should you be going to this text will the students be able to relate to it so the reaction of my students and even now what i feel as a reader as um, a part of the audience i feel a sense of relief i find a sense of relief at the end of who's afraid of virginia full all the three times it happened that there is a sense of relief as if there was some just like nasur jaisa nikal gaya khatam hua okay i am in touch with my reality this is what i have to live with let me live with it there is a sense of relief and i can tell you professor that uh, my students they were easily able to relate to it whether they were from nan or kullu or whichever remote part they were easily able to relate i think it is out about fears which we all have and fears we want to face and then we have to feel that life will still go on when we have face those fears manjinder what was your reaction manjinder yeah same uh, my title is also fighting the demons uh, leading a life which is free of all illusions and we see that in the modern society after the two world wars uh, there is breakdown of familial values there is breakdown of family system and uh, that very realization that there is the breakdown and we are living in an illusionary world and we re we need to bang on you know with full force uh, come into the buzz of reality and start dealing one thing at a time uh, so that's basically we are indebted to edward lv for creating such a play and it was huge success uh, though for certain political reasons it was uh, denied the pulitzer prize uh, which uh, later on was compensated uh, for the coming plays uh, when lv received Uh, so just uh, had a long uh, coming and facing the fears uh, that's the one message which that i can bring me to that brings me to kondram kondram can you hear me i the lights went off huh kondram can you hear me kondram you are muted kondram uh, oh. yes ma'am i can hear you yeah yeah so just briefly do you think you could sum up uh you could tell us if harold pinter would be appreciated by the audience today you know because he uses a different kind of a uh, he uses different kind of devices he has those non verbal 
uh, means of communication, the drumbeat, silence, and so on. So how, how do you think today's playgoers would react to him? Uh, Mama, I think actually uh, when Harold Pinto was uh, started writing the play, he got uh, so many criticism uh, uh, about, you know, about, his, about how he uh, presented his plays. But I think to this generation, our generation will be quite easy to understand. I mean, quite uh, very satisfa satisfactory, uh, satisfactorily uh, read his plays because it tells us so much our life in, 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 in our times and it is very much, his place are very much relevant these days because the way he presented a situation in which he, he presented uh, two or three characters and try to uh, not, you know, uh, tell exactly what he is going to say or what he is trying to tell. But we are, we as an audience have to, uh, uh, you know, search the meaning in his place. And that is why I think uh, his place are quite, uh, will be quite meaningfully studied uh, in our time than it, it was pre previously done. Okay, so it's a bleak world that they present and because we are living in bleak circumstances, uh, we seem to respond to them. Uh, the response has come from yes. Emma uh, to the question that I sent him. The audiences in Dhaka were overwhelmed by the performance. The performance of the thing, the thing, the play that was, that was inspired by Godot, or which has similarities with Godot. They found it quite unusual and refreshing. The success of the thing led Said Ahmed to stage the mile post in 1965. Thank you, Ahmed, for your response. And now I would like Nasser to say something and sum up this yes. portion. This sum up this portion of the se this yes. session, this part of the session, so that we can move yes. on to Kafka. Yes, Nasser. Definitely. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, actually, just I had my own question from Ahmed, Professor Ahmed, but unfortunately, just uh, he cannot speak. Uh, it was so why don't you? Why with... don't you ask the question and answer it yourself? You know what could be the possible answer? Okay. Seriously, yeah. I'm you serious. know, just uh, I'm serious. He, sir. Okay. Yes. You know, it is my question. Uh, maybe uh, he considered uh, that Bangladeshi. Uh, uh, dramatist, uh, a kind of misreading. Maybe it is not a misreading, it is, you know, just if we remember uh, strategies post-colonial authors used to dismantle the, uh, actually, uh, the orientation of power in Western drama, okay? So maybe just it was a kind of, uh, uh, actually, uh, what, counter-discursive way of writing, you know, yes, it was uh, his, uh, he wanted to uh, actually uh, dismantle the orientation of power in uh, Waiting for Godot. It is, uh, maybe it is not just misreading, because most of the time in the beginning of uh, post-colonial uh, drama, uh, dramatists uh, were accused of misreading of uh, Eurocentric authors, you know, uh, saying you don't know English, I don't know. Just you don't know how to uh, follow standard uh, standard English grammar. You don't know how to write dialogue. But uh, the way dialogue was written by post-colonial dramatists was on purpose. Maybe it was not just a misreading of the uh, a Eurocentric drama. Okay, uh, maybe it is. Uh, I mean. Uh, he, uh, Bangladeshi uh, author, on purpose tried to dismantle the orientation of the play. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So should we, with that, we'll move on to Vivek. And uh, even though it's a different author altogether, the theme and the atmosphere that we are dealing with is very much similar. So with Vivek, we move on to Kafka and Vivek. Yes. Uh, yes, Vivek, uh, is there a screen sharing button at the bottom of your video? Yes, I, have, I can see it. Yeah, so. Uh, a little later. Yeah, so we'll uh, try doing it later. Yes. But meanwhile, let me introduce you to Vivek. Uh, Nasser, please let me introduce Vivek yes. to the. 
Yes, please, yeah. please, please, please. Uh, Vivek, has, please. Uh, Vivek is a professor of English at uh, Guru Gobind Singh uh, Indraprast University in Dwarka, Delhi. And he's also been a student of Punjab University. He has been uh, a student of <laughs> mine at the MA level. And someone I'm very proud of because he's really shaped into a very nice professor, very sensitive, very sensitive, very artistic, and interested in just the right kind of things. So yes. welcome Vivek, welcome Vivek. He paints, he sings, he has this music in him, so you can trust him, you know? People who have no music in them can't be trusted. But this gentleman has music in him. And uh, uh, well, thank you Vivek yes. for joining us today. He'll be talking to us on Kafka. Yes, Vivek, please announce your topic. Thank and you very much, ma'am. Go ahead, please. And thanks for your kind words about me. It was really music to the ears. <laughs> You deserve everything. You deserve it, really. That's so kind of. Very proud of you, huh? And it's good to see some old friends in Mahim and Ila, and good to see new friends in Nasir and uh, Ahmed. Thank you. Manjander as well. I must congratulate you, Manju, ma'am, for for going back to the basics, because in the last 20, 30, 35 years in India as well, I think there has been a lot of emphasis on. Uh, on social sciences, the issues of social sciences that we were reading through literature, but in the process, what we were feeling that literature was being pushed in back burners. Uh, COVID could be one reason of going back to the basics, but I think text is one thing which has always been important. Because whatever philosophy we discuss, whatever issues of sociology or social sciences we discuss, we discuss through text. So that way, text is everything for us. The way the reader says everything is in the text for us, yes, mm -hmm. text, everything should be, we should be able to find everything through the text. And I'll try to talk about uh, one, Kafka's work, The Trial, and then there are different adaptations of, on, on The Trial. One was made by Orson Welles in 1962. Second was made by David Jones in 1993. There is a recent Russian adaptation, which I'm not touching. If time permits me, I will touch David Jones because I know that we are running behind the schedule. Otherwise, I limit myself to, to Kafka and Austin Wells. And it cannot be denied that Kafka is one of those authors who revisit us. 20th century for that way has given us so many poets, novelists, dramatists, who we revisit and who, and they also come back to us in different ways, in different times, and they stand relevant to us. Some of the works, including the other day we were discussing the wasteland, the work itself has become a metaphor. That's, that's the, the strength of certain works and certain writers in the 20th century. And Kafka, to a very large extent, when you read him, you find that he is almost prophetic. What Pinter is doing in the 50s and 60s, Kafka was already singing that song in, in, in the second decade of the 20th century. Uh, since I'll be talking about adaptation as well, I would like to give a very brief uh, overview about my approach towards adaptation. So that when we actually discuss films, there isn't any uh, lack of clarity or contradiction. Uh, no doubt adaptation is a process of transmutation changes when art is adapted from one form to another, be it drama is staged on play, oh, sorry, uh, it's staged on, on, on stage, performed on stage, it is adaptation. If a poem is written on, on painting, it is a kind of adaptation. If a film is made on, on a literary work, it is an adaptation. If film gives birth to a literary work, sometimes literary works, they have followed, uh, followed, followed films. That is also kind of adaptation. This, because one story is moving from one medium to another, changes are inevitable. We these days do not enter into what, what is called fidelity criticism in film studies. We don't wish to compare the film version with the, with the literary version. 
and I'm deliberately not using even the term like the source and and its adaptation because that also gives some kind of priority and hierarchy to 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 one or to literary work or maybe one kind of work. Whenever a filmmaker makes a film based on on, on literature, the kind of adaptation we are discussing now, uh, there can be various reasons. Sometimes maybe the filmmaker is fascinated so much by the literary world that he or she wants to retell the same story through, through his her own medium. Or sometimes there are some voices which are moving in the subtext of, of the literary world and the filmmaker wants to bring those voices to surface. And sometimes filmmakers disagrees with some ideas given in the literary works and filmmaker takes a different take on it. So every adaptation operates differently. We should not be the only warning or caveat is we should not be looking for the book in the film. What a playwright can do in a play, what a novelist can do in a novel, which can go up to 400 pages, 500 pages, 600 pages, a filmmaker cannot do in a small time frame of two hours or two and a half hours. That is one challenge. Second challenge is there are certain things which a novelist or a writer can write very overtly, very clearly, but if a filmmaker has to tell the same or present the same idea, perhaps filmmaker has to, will have to invent a couple of episodes. And that is where my intervention has been that film has generally been understood as narrative form. But if we try to understand that overall discourse of, of, of film, overall narration of film, you will find films depend equally on the dramatic elements. So maybe it, it's the acting, it's the dialogue, and within dialogue, camera also plays important part in narration. So my uh, intervention is that film is both dig diegetic art as well as mimetic art. Keeping these couple of things in mind, I'll first discuss Franz Kafka's trial, and then I'll discuss Orson Welles version, adaptation of it, it's called The Trial. And then if time permits me, I will talk about uh, David Jones, The Trial. In interesting part is why I, I would like to discuss David Jones, The Trial is because the screenplay was written by Pinter. And there have been a couple of presentations on Harold Pinter and, and the ideas that he was presenting in his place. Uh, Kafka is certainly, no doubt, he is one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. He is obscure, he is complex, he is abstract, and his incomprehensibility and at the same time inexplicable situations that he puts in, in his writings. We cannot understand Kafka in the conventional model of rationality or in the Cartesian model of rationality. Somewhere he challenges that. But there are certain things in Kafka's writings that we go back to, to his writings again and again. Metamorphosis is one, the castle work is another, the trial is another. I think Kafka is one who explored the metaphysical crisis of humanity in the 21st century, in, in the beginning of the 21st century. Another aspect about Kafka, which I'm just throwing an idea right now, which will become important when we will discuss of Orson Welles' film is his identity. He was born in Prague to Jewish parents. And when he, he was born in perhaps 1883, that was the time even in, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Czech was a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, the question of Czech language had become very important. There was a considerable size of Czech or population of Czech Jewish, even in Germany, and they wanted that Czech language should be recognized as one important language. But in Austria-Hungarian Empire, German was becoming the official language. Kafka is not writing in, in the Czech. He decided to write 
in German. The language which was, we can say, culturally not his, but politically it was given to him. And then there are different versions of German. One German used in Germany, one German used in Austria, and another kind of German which was used in, in Czechoslovakia in those days. So this idea will keep in mind and I'll bring it later that why it is important to keep Kafka's Jewish identity in mind when we try to understand him. This work, the trial was written somewhere around 1914 and 15, but he was, it was published after his death in 1925. Kafka died in 1924. And Kafka's upbringing was that he, when he grew up in Prague, though Prague has a good size of Jewish population and there are a number of synagogues even now uh, in the city, he was almost growing in a Christian atmosphere. And he goes back to, he refers to cathedrals and churches in his writing. How do we interpret it? That's a different matter. But in his family, they were also not playing Jewish identity too much. He became conscious of his Jewish identity when Czech Jewish treated Polish Jewish in a different way in 1911 or so. So in that atmosphere, when he started writing his works, so there are certain forces which are there in his unconscious, they start surfacing. Another important thing that we need to keep in mind about Kafka is that why is he so much against authority? It's not necessarily Jewish and German conflict. Another aspect is that Kafka grew up in a family in which his father was a very dominating figure. His father belonged to the working class. He, his father was born in a village, then he shifted to Prague. He married a businessman's daughter and he became a successful businessman in Prague as well. And he was physically very strong, big in size. Kafka on the other hand was a weak child, physically very weak. And his father was so dominating, a dominating a person, sorry, that in his letters, Kafka has mentioned that it was almost a trauma to live as a child under his shadow. It is this complex dynamics. One, on the hand, there is the politics of austria hungary empire, which is working. Second, anti-Semitic policies were there in the austria hungary empire, but they were not practicing it very strongly in, in the 1910s because they did not want any kind of disturbance, but it would be sensed. Third, his personal family circumstances. So his personal, political, and larger historical factors, they are working simultaneously in a way to make Kafka the way we know him now. Uh, this particular work, The Trial, is about a man, Joseph K, who suddenly wakes up one morning and finds that he has been arrested or he is under arrest. And he's not given, he's not given any reason for that. This is the beginning of the, of the, of the work and then the work ends when he is executed. These are two positions, two points which can be logically connected. In between, there is a set of events. So many things happen. Joseph K is never told that what charges have been leveled against him. What is his crime? But he's running literally from pillar to post to prepare his defense. He is allowed to go to the bank where he works as a clerk. But then one day phone, he, he attends, receives a phone call informing him that you are supposed to attend your trial on Sunday. Look at the paradoxes that Kafka is building. Where trial is held, is that is not a conventional legal court. He enters the locality of, uh, of the economically lower class society. He enters one house where a woman is washing clothes in a, in a tub and she directs him that you open that door in the house in her own house, that he opened this door. And when he opens the door, he finds himself there in the, in the court. 
and the court is in session. Kafka, time and time again in the entire narrative has built so many events which we cannot understand or comprehend logically, which we cannot understand rationally. And that is one thing which Kafka, I think, reinforces again and again, the nightmarish experiences, protagonist being disoriented and his inability to understand the things happening to him, ultimately they contribute to what we all know as Kafka's. He creates that atmosphere. <clears throat> well, in that, the seeming logical connection is suddenly Kaf uh, this Joseph K's uncle visits him and he says, okay, I'll take you to, to a lawyer, to an advocate who can help you out in this case. Joseph K's parents are not mentioned, but his uncle appears. He's taken to, to an advocate and while he's at, at the advocate's house, he has a small fling with, with his mistress, advocate's mistress. While advocate is discussing his case, how to save him, he is more interested in having a fling with, the, with his mistress. Then one day again, back in the bank, his officer tells him that we have certain guests. They would like to visit certain cathedral to show them up. And when he goes there to show, uh, to meet the visitors, visitors are not there. But priest knows that, you, that this man has been accused. Everywhere, wherever he goes, people know that, you, that this man, K, has been accused. But K does not know what he has been accused of what he has been charged with. He goes to a painter, perhaps painter can help him with it, through his connections in the court. Again, nothing works for him. It is that kind of situation that Kafka has presented in his work. The question is, what is Kafka trying to do? Kafka is raising some, some what we call fundamental questions. Kafka is raising some fundamental questions and those fundamental questions are of human freedom. Those fundamental questions are of guilt in a society which is becoming over authoritarian, which is becoming over oppressive. And in that oppressive authoritarian society, anybody can be picked up, anybody can be tried, and at the end, anybody can be executed. And the last word that he says, like a dog, sums up everything. That the existence of perhaps modern man is like a dog. When this man goes to the cathedral, the priest tells him a parable which sums up what's happening in the entire novel. And that is the parable of justice. And what that parable is that a countryman goes to the, to the maybe we can say, to the citadel of, of justice, to the institution of justice and he waits outside, the guard doesn't let him enter. He waits there till he grows old and he's almost about to die. Then the guard comes and tells him that you were the right man to enter the justice. But in a way he was not allowed and at that moment gates were again finally closed to him and he dies there. This denial of justice which Kafka writes in his work, I quote, one must lie low, the matter how much it went against the grain, must try to understand that this great organization remains, so to speak, in a state of delicate balance. And that if someone took it upon himself to alter the disposition of things around him, he ran the risk of losing his footing and falling to destruction. This is from, from the trial. And this, I think, sums up what Kafka is trying to say through the work. That most of the institutions of modern society, they betray man. It is, he might not have committed any crime, but he has internalized the guilt. And this internalization of the guilt makes him guilty. Now question comes when Orson Welles adapts this film, what does he do?
Are you trying to share your screen, Vivek? Yes, yes ma'am, I am. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. No. No. There's a bottom, at the bottom, there's a share screen, green button. I clicked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we can see it. Now we can see it. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Here it is, yes. Now, Orson Welles, when he is adapting this film in 1962, the question is, how does he handle what we call Kafkaesque or what we, what we can say the dread, the terror that Kafka portrays in his work and at the same time, logical incomprehensibility. Because adapting a work is not merely process of retelling the same story in another medium. Adaptation is also a process of critically understanding the work and then adapting it according to your medium and create a new work out of it. Orson Welles, when he made this film in 1962, before that he was already known, he was an established uh, filmmaker in America. He had already made this, a film called Citizen Kane in 1941, which was considered to be his best film and even now when anyone is introduced into film narration or to understand that how film narration takes place then Citizen Kane is a film which is shown. He had adapted Macbeth, he had adapted Othello and now it was Kafka in the trial. He begins with the parable of justice. This is the opening shot of the film and he used a particular technique called pin screen in order to create these visuals in which we can see there is one guard who is standing and then he has created the motif of door within door, but at the same time there may be doors within door, but the countryman is denied the entry. The parable which Kafka has almost used in the second last chapter of, of his work when Joseph K. meets a priest, the film begins with that. But what after that? There, there are a number of shots in which Orson Welles is trying to show that Joseph K. is surrounded by the state authority people. This is the opening scene of the film when two representatives of the state, they enter uh, Joseph K's house and declare that uh, he is under arrest. This is one shot towards the, uh, from the end of the film when he's being finally taken for execution. It is in this, uh, this kind of composition that Orson Welles makes. And Orson Welles' attempt was not merely to retell the same story. Orson Welles through the film has created a new text in which he has used the aesthetics of cinema greatly under the influence of, we, we can say, his, but he was very close to, uh, to, to German expressionism to suggest certain ideas. This is one small shot from uh, when he goes to meet the painter and runs away from his house and look at the use of light and shade in this shot. This is a small narrow passage. On the both sides, there are some wooden strips and the light comes from there. And we actually cannot see what he is running through. And this is another shot when he's running through a tunnel. And look at the, the, the this size of the shadow and the size of the actual body. This use of light and shade, which Orson Welles has used, is it's very close to, to German expressionist uh, cinema we can say. Then important aspect of Orson Welles treatment is that he has relocated the film in American context. This film is not happening in Europe. This film is not happening in Prague. So when Orson Welles is taking this film to, to America, there are other signifiers which talk about American socioeconomic reality of the times. Look at these two extreme long shots and 
this is the office where he works and this is the legal institution where he goes he the number of workers which are there the use of extreme long shots deep focus they signify the magnitude of bureaucracy in the country and it is this aspect which even kafka is also suggesting in his work that state institutions bureaucracy they have got such a strong hold that individual when put against them is is almost nobody now there can be certain things which a novelist can can directly write but filmmaker cannot write anything so filmmaker has to invent his own language this is again another shot in which we can say the americans new economy apartments offices where he goes they all have been highlighted this is a shot from the trial scene joseph key is standing here but the filmmaker's focus is to show on on the number of people who surround him and everybody is looking at him though he makes a very very confident flamboyant speech here that how this system in a way takes away innocent people like me today it's me who has been arrested yesterday or uh, tomorrow it can be anybody else but nobody listens to him orson welles is inventing his film language to suggest that individual when put against the entire society or or or, or the entire city whether it is a socio economic aspect or whether it is a bureaucratic aspect individual is vulnerable the vulnerability of individual is being in a way narrated by the filmmaker through his own cinematic device but orson welles the strength of orson welles film is not merely that he has taken the film to america made in 1962 he is talking about american economy he is also talking talking about american technocratic society and how all these socio economic and other institutions of american society are against the uh, against the liberty of individual orson welles taking the discourse of the film to a further level to to he adds another another extension to it and that is what if kafka was the prophet of fascism one which kafka is in a way we can say he is praised for that in 1913 14 15 he could anticipate what is going to happen in europe and that was the the rise of fascist forces and the the treatment which jewish people are going to receive and that is where kafka's jewish identity becomes very important and kafka was not the only one to in a way to anticipate this there was another film made in 1920s by robert mian the film is called the cabinet of dr caligari it's a german film that film also sums up the same idea that perhaps germany is waiting for a for a dictator for a totalitarian autocratic regime which in which one leader is so powerful that the individual liberty liberty will be compromised but the society is prepared for that kind of a leadership interestingly robert wien was also a jew and he was born in a district which is these days in poland but at that time it was part of of the german empire all these things are happening in 1914 15 kafka is writing this work in 1920 robert wien is making a film and perhaps they are making a prophetic statement that something is going to happen in in europe and we know what happened in europe during the second world war holocaust took place and ila was talking about gas chambers and and concentration camps but this film is made in 1962 holocaust has happened and the world knows about the horrors of holocaust the question is how does robert pian respond to this 
Kafka could be prophetic about certain things that Europe is perhaps heading towards a totalitarian regime, uh, to, towards an autocratic uh, political structure. And if Kafka is saying that these totalitarian autocratic structures are against individuals, Joseph K's character exemplifies the conflict between individual and the totalitarian regime. But how to deal with this idea once these things have happened? So Robert Vian, when he made this film in 1962, he is extending the discourse of the film. America directly didn't have anything to do with concentration camps that way. But he has used certain shots in the film which remind us of people the way they were kept in concentration camps. What there is a situation in the film, Joseph K standing here, he is he has gone to an, uh, he is attending a ballet perhaps, and there he receives a message to come out. When he goes out, he suddenly finds himself at a metro station, and from metro station, when he runs, he finds himself in a crowd of this kind of people. All of them are almost naked, very weak, and these faces, this condition of human bodies, they remind us of the visuals of, of concentration camps, the way people were treated there. So this film, which is made in 1962, when Holocaust has happened, and the world is very much aware of the history now, just now Orson Welles is extending the discourse in which is there in Kafka's supply. Orson Welles' attempt is not to retell the story which is taking place in Kafka's work. Orson Welles' attempt is to interpret that story in his own socio-political context and to bring in certain elements from history and to, we can say maybe, to, to build a new discourse, to build a new text. Thing which we should know about uh, here is, this film was made in 1962 or 63. In 1961, Orson Welles was also interrogated by FBI. He was interrogated for having cherished communist ideology. So on the one hand, Kafka has his own reasons, maybe personal, maybe political, to talk about the authoritarian regime. Then we have Orson Welles, who has his own reasons, again, to talk about an authoritarian political system. And in 1962, if we go back to the history of America, the kind of policies Kennedy was, President Kennedy was following, the international policies, he was dead against communist ideology. This, these were the reasons that perhaps how Orson Welles is extending the discourse which is there in Kafka, the conflict between individual and the authoritarian regime, and the kind of restrictions it can put on individuals. And it can also annihilate concentration camps, visuals of concentration camps, they simply remind that how this kind of totalitarian system can lead to or can go to the extent of complete annihilation of human race. And that is where the ending of the film becomes more important to discuss. When Kafka ends the novel, Joseph K is in a way taken by two executioners, state representative, I showed you the shot. He doesn't give much resistance, just tiny resistance that he offers. He's taken away and he's executed and the dagger is driven into his chest. That is how Joseph K. dies in the text and his last words were like a dog. This K in Orson Welles films refuses to die without any res resistance. He resists. He is taken to a pit by two executioners. His shirt is removed. And they are wondering whether they should use dagger or not. 
and two executioners, they are exchanging daggers and K is looking at them. But then they decide not to use the dagger and they leave, leave him there. For a second, we get this idea, perhaps they have changed their mind. Joseph K, the character also mocks at them. And he tells them that you can't kill me like that. But by the time they leave the pit, they throw a stick of dynamite into it. And soon it blasts. And when it blows, there is only smoke, suggesting death. And not only smoke, the last shot of the film is this mushroom of formation of smoke, which reminds people of the nuclear attack on Japan in the Second World War by America. Mm -hmm. so Orson Welles is taking his positions, though Orson Welles in one of his interviews, he denies that I'm not suggesting America's dropping a nuclear bomb on Japan, but it has been interpreted like that, that in a subtle way, uh, Orson Welles is not merely attacking uh, the autocratic regime of, of Europe, of Hitler, but he's also attacking the policies of, of America in his times as well. So that is one aspect which, through which we can say Orson Welles is extending uh, his cinematic uh, discourse through his film. Then this is the last part which I would like to discuss. The parable of justice which is shown in the beginning comes back again towards the end of the film when K is there in the advocate's house. And the advocate shows him these clips now. This shadow which we can see is Joseph K's shadow. And then he goes there, speaks to, to the advocate and what happens that K also becomes a part of the composition, which was shown to us in the beginning. And that is where, and this is the last shot of that scene, when the presentation ends, we can see there is a cinema-like screen behind K and he's standing in front of him. In a way, Orson Welles is making his film a bit of self-reflexive. That how visual media is also becoming, making a comment on, on this, number one, the art itself and also on the situation itself. And that is where I think Orson Welles very creatively, he has, it's, it's a very ambitious statement to make, but he has created an independent text. He has become an author of the film because he is adapting Kafka, but while adapting Kafka, his attempt is not merely to retell us the story in Kafka, he is recontextualizing it in American context. And when he recontextualizes in the American context, he is also bringing in certain elements from history, from the Second World War, from the current American international policies. And at the same time, the institution of cinema itself. So these, so many things he's mixing up in his film. Rationally speaking, we cannot justify showing these visuals in the film. That what are these human beings doing, standing naked at night when some kind of ballet show was going on inside the uh, uh, auditorium. But remember Orson Welles was adapting Kafka. He is not supposed to follow the linear rationality. What Orson Welles has done while adapting Kafka, if Kafka was also under the influence of German expressionism in literature, because in painting expressionism had already emerged by the time Kafka was writing his works. Orson Welles is using expressionist modes of film narration in, in, in his film. There was another shot which I, I have already shown you. This one. This one and the previous one. So Orson Welles' engagement with Kafka is not merely at the level of plots. Orson Welles' 
engagement with Kafka is not merely at the level of one character. His engagement with Kafka is at the level of situation, fundamental situation of modern man, modern man's vulnerability, overpowering state institutions, authoritarianism, and if that authoritarianism is redefined in the age of capitalism, Orson Welles is open to that as well. And at the same time, he establishes one kind of aesthetic relationship between his work and Kafka's work. I mean, do I have five minutes to- No, start? no, we have to close, we have to close, we have to close. So I will not be talking about the trial by David Jones, but the main thing which I, I wanted to discuss with through my small presentation was that when Orson Welles is adapting Kafka, he is adapting Kafka. And that Kafka experience of nightmarish experience, the metaphysical dread, and the condition of human being, it has been recontextualized and retold in a new historical context within his, we can say, uh, within his aesthetic for cinema. Thank you very much. Could you stop the screen share, please? Thank you, thank you. Oh, it's 4.30, I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> But you held us all spellbound. You. you held us all spellbound, and we have run out of time, and we need to close because there are other meetings going on. And uh, yeah, before we close, there is uh, um, Dr. Mukherjee here. Dr. Mukherjee would like to ask you a couple of questions, make some observations, and after that, Nasser will wrap up yes. uh, wrap up the session, and we'll okay. wind. Mukherjee, Sanjay Mukherjee. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Yeah, I, I immensely enjoyed uh, your presentation. Thank you. Professor Vivek. Uh, uh, it seems, again, uh, the more we are moving towards the uh, middle of the 20th century uh, through uh, uh, Beckett, through Pinter, the more we are, again, going back, your own observation that how Kafka seems to be anticipating. Uh, George Orwell was there yesterday, the Orwellian and today the absurdists. In the, in the etymological sense, I find uh, Kafka uh, in, in the sense of go, moving out of harmony, in that sense, how, how well Kafka presents his work. And, and it also seems to me that like you discovered once again Kafka through cinema, uh, because it is quite, quite a, a text which is further back into the beginning of the 20th century. We all, as students of literature, seem to be, seem to discover key texts through other texts, whether cinematic or even critical. Now, I want to share a very interesting thing. When I purchased this book in 1993, this book had three comments at the rare jacket. Mm -hmm. I was a student at MS University Baroda. Out of the three names, I knew two names. That is Vladimir Nabokov and Albert Camus. I did not know George Steiner, who George Steiner was at that point of time in 1993. And I, George Steiner, by the way, died in February, 2020 and a professor of comparative literature at Harvard and Geneva, and a professor of poetry at Oxford. And in, in early 21st century, doing my own research on cultural criticism through F.R. Lewis, who was George Steiner's teacher, I discovered George Steiner and George Steiner's writings. I will take less than a minute to just read out what George Steiner has to write about Kafka. No other voice has borne truer witness to the dark of our times. The trial exhibits the classic model of the terror state. It prefigures the furtive sadism, the hysteria with which totalitarianism insinuates into private and sexual life, the faceless boredom of the killers. The labyrinth of his meanings opens out 
at its secret, difficult exits to the high roads of modern sensibility to what is most urgent and relevant in our condition. This is when I read it, I found it again, early uh, 2002, three, I, I, I got to know George Steiner. And, and I felt that was as, as, as a critic, very prophetic. Now, once again, I discovered through your wonderful presentation. So it, it connects back to uh, today to a critic, very important critic, George Steiner, to the author Kafka. Thank you very much for that. One question about the, about the technique of film. You mentioned German expressionism. I felt uh, uh, with Orson Welles, as well as the later uh, Konstantin, uh, the, uh, the Russian uh, uh, director. Yeah, uh, the person. Uh, so I felt uh, a lot of film noir techniques into it. What would you say about that? This light and shadow, the, the lengthening shadow through the small light. Its answer is very simple. Noir is greatly influenced by German Expressionism. Hmm. So if you, uh, if you, uh, have you seen that film by the Russian filmmaker? Yes, I have. In the opening scene, when again state representatives come to arrest Joseph K. Correct. This film by Robert Vian, which I talked about, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is going on. Mm -hmm. There is a scene in which a ghost-like shadow comes to kidnap a, a girl. Correct. Correct. That scene is from this film, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And again, you are not wrong when you say that it's film noir, the use of light and shade. It's very strongly there. But noir is again linked with gangster films, with the underworld, with the negative shady sides of human society. But those aesthetics are influenced from the expressionism. Right. But you are also reminded of, yeah, the theater of menace is also quite a bit there, anticipating that Kafka does. If you read Kafka, I, when I read Pinter in MA days, I remember that we used to, literally, I remember, one of my classmates, he was staying with me in the same hostel. My room was on the first floor. His room was on the ground floor. After finishing Pinter, he came to my room and he was more of a wrestler. And we were not expecting him to give a sensitive statement about literature, but he said, Vivek, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. He said in Hindi. Mm -hmm. that I'm not using Hindi because I know there are some people who can't understand Hindi here. But he felt it. We were, yes, carried over by Pinter that what kind of world he's showing. We almost, Manju Mem used to teach us the waste diet in MA2, MA second year. Right. And we, we, we used to imagine ourselves that we are wastelanders. The world we are living in is like a wasteland. You read Kafka, he is almost giving you that kind of experience 30, 40 years before. He's anticipating things That's which are happening. Yeah. Pinter is responding. Hmm. Pinter is responding to what has happened in Europe. And I'm very happy one presenter talked about, he mentioned Pinter's Jewish identity. And Pinter was very active in Jewish politics as well. But Correct. here is a man who is anticipating in 1914-15 what is going to happen to humanity at large. Though Harold Broom had said that uh, Kafka is primarily a Jewish writer. Hmm. But Kafka is not playing on his Jewish identity so much. He is not a consciously a Jewish writer who is doing Jewish politics through his writings. He is raising issues which concern all of us. All of us, yeah. Of larger humanity. His Jewish identity might be contributing to that worldview. But yes, he is at least, he is able to talk about those things which world will in a way witness in the next 30 years. So that you talk about theater of menace, absurdism is something you can find mm. in Kafka. Yeah. Mm. Meaninglessness is there. And that is why his works are that they are, they are maybe they are designed or structured like that. Meaninglessness of language, of situation, somebody being thrown into a situation. Existence. Find, existence. And that is, uh, look, at the look at the connections between Pinter and Kafka. Two mm. men entering room is a motif in Pinter's place. Correct. 
And that is happening in the trial as well. So I think this is where when our worldview, we, we start sharing the worldview, we start sharing the, maybe the emotional effect of certain things which happen around us, our aesthetics, they also, we, we start sharing there as well. So it's not different, difficult to understand why theater of menace or why absurdism is there in, in Kafka, which appeared later in theater of the absurd as well. So these connections are linked with the world. Not with so, the so, which means, thank you, thank you, Manju, ma'am, for again, like we move into the 1960s, sitting in 2020s, and then again go back into the pastness of the past of 1915. So this this wonderful going back to key texts happened okay. because of your coordination. Thank you once again. I'm thank you, everyone. I'm Vivek, ready. I enjoyed your yeah. presentation. Yeah. Uh, Purnima, you have anything to say? Purnima? Purnima is back on the screen. Please yes, I was on the mute. So, wow, what a discussion. So, I'm blown. Uh, we were glued to our seats while Vivek's presentations was going on. Uh, so, last, there is one thing, a few things we, I want to add here is that uh, uh, I think Mahim sir has started with the with the presentation when he said which kind of text we want to go through the in the 21st century. So, I guess the answer is right in front of us that uh, Yes, it should be the mixer with the reality and the illusions, which uh, Professor uh, uh, Ilam M. and uh, Manindra Man had rightly said, because she has taken us to our classrooms. And I think in this pandemic crisis, one question that is coming to our mind, that is, who is afraid of Virginia Woolf? So I think answer is that we all are afraid of Virginia Woolf because we are afraid of illusions, right? Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving me this support. Lata, what do you have to say? Lata, what do you have to say? Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. So I, ha I have exceptionally enjoyed today's seminar, and it was indeed a intellectual stimulating seminar. Uh, as I have been very much affected by the works of Pinter, so I just want to add a few lines about the most influential British playwright, uh, Pinter. So he has never been strictly considered as a, you know, a political playwright in literature. However, uh, he has delivered a speech, uh, you know, while receiving the Nobel Prize, which makes it clear that, uh, you know, politics has been an integral part of his um, work. And uh, with this, uh, there was a spirit of, uh, you know, um, resistances in his in his place so whether it doesn't matter he belongs to a you know he is a playwright or a politician he significant you know carries a significant mission in this world so if i have a, if you have a time i just want to quote a very terrific lines by uh, harold printer so when the when the storm is over and night falls and the moon is out in all its glory and all you are left with is the rhythm of the sea of the waves you know what God intended for human race. You know what paradise is. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. That's very nice. Over to you, Nasser. Please wrap it up and we'll yes. wind up for today. Yeah. Nasser? Okay. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, actually, just uh, today, uh, we uh, all together try to talk about somehow, generally speaking, about the theater of the uh, absurd, okay, uh, this term used to uh, uh, characterize the, uh, some uh, European-American uh, dramatists of 1950s, 1960s, as the term suggests, the function of such theater is to give dramatic expressions to philosophical uh, notions of absurd as a notion uh, that had uh, received widespread, okay, following Camus' uh, guest, Sisyphus, and uh, Beckett's, uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Uh, first, I, I would like to say again, thank you so much to Ahmad. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have him here directly, but thanks to Ma'am Jetka. Uh, she actually just read uh, whatever somehow you wanted to say, uh, maybe just, just in the future we have. Asad, he has just sent a yes. message saying that the typhoon has arrived and uh, he's having oh. he to log out. Yeah, carry on, please. Yes, yes, God willing. God, God willing. Okay. So, uh, and then just after uh, Ahmad, who wanted to talk about waiting for Godot, and uh, something so interesting for me 
uh, actually just talking about uh, an author in Bangladesh uh, who uh, actually just uh, due to Ahmad, I'm quoting Ahmad quote, Miss Red, uh, okay, just waiting for Godo. And then uh, we had uh, uh, Mahim, Mahim Sharma, okay. Uh, uh, he uh, delivered a lecture on uh, the dry uh, tree, uh, 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 actually just uh, awaited, uh, that, uh, awaited Godo, a chaotic study of Samuel Beck, uh, Beckett's waiting for Godo. Uh, so uh, it was, again, so interesting for me, a very interesting uh, lecture. And then after him, actually we talked uh, uh, just uh, Kondram, uh, if I'm not wrong about yeah. the pronunciation, who, yes, yeah. uh, he talked about uh, Pinter, political implication in the place of uh, Pinter. And, uh, you know, just now, uh, due to uh, one of the uh, participants here, uh, Pinter talking, writing about Manus, the theater of Manus, you know, just nowadays we can feel it, uh, you know, just with our body, with our soul, you know, just everybody. Uh, things that, oh, oh my God, maybe, uh, uh, you know, just coronavirus is behind the door. Wanna just knock the door and come in and say, hi, hello, just how are you? I'm here to kill you, okay, to torture you. Uh, and we can feel Pinter so well nowadays, okay, uh, in totalitarian, uh, actually, regimes uh, and in uh, the time of coronavirus, and then uh, we had uh, actually Ila. Ila talked about a compre a compre just uh, comprehending the absurd. Edward Albies, who is afraid of Virginia Woolf. And nowadays, you know, just it seems everybody uh, actually just uh, is afraid of uh, coronavirus, not Virginia Woolf. Okay, uh, and then uh, thanks to uh, Professor Vivek, uh, I enjoyed uh, his lecture a lot about uh, Kafka and especially about uh, actually the adaptation of Orson Welles 1962 uh, from Kafka. It was somehow what we heard from different, actually just uh, professors from different parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Jetka. With for, that, uh, I would gathering. like to thank, yeah. Yes, you said something. Yeah, I, I, I do appreciate you. I do appreciate what you are doing here to collect, okay, just some people from uh, the globe, around the globe, talking about the issues we do need. Thank you, Professor Jetka. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, Nasser. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people who are on the panel today. And again, the technology has uh, played uh, hide and seek with us because the gentleman from Meghale has dropped out and Bangladeshi had to leave because the typhoon was knocking at his door. Uh, but uh, the rest of oh us are God. here. The rest of us are here. Thank you, Vivek. That was really spellbinding. Manjinder, thank you. Purnima, Lata, Ila, Mahim. Mahim and also Sanjay, thank you so much for joining in. We are going to meet tomorrow again at two o'clock. Please be with us. Bye for now. Bye, thanks.